seven exciting things uh, that we want to go through, and we've already got the first one done. Uh, so the second is um, just an overview about why this is important uh, in the first place. So why do we need uh, accessible documents? Uh, we're going to focus on Word, Microsoft Word, and PowerPoint, um, and also specifically digital uh, documents. So not how to make your make your print documents accessible, but how to make your digital Word and PowerPoint files accessible. Um, so after that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Jean, who's going to do uh, the next three agenda items. So uh, how can I plan for accessibility? So what do you do before you even open up Microsoft Word or PowerPoint? <laughs> Uh, the fourth and the longest agenda item is going to be focusing on um, how can I use uh, Word and PowerPoint to create accessible documents. After that, once you've created a great document, uh, how do you save it and share it in a way that you didn't just lose all of the wonderful uh, work that you put into making it accessible? Um, and then after that, we're going to talk about next steps. Uh, so agenda item six is how can I start? So what can you do next? Um, and we've got just a couple basic ideas there. And then with the seventh agenda item, uh, we want to get your feedback uh, about the uh, presentation today uh, and also an opportunity to follow up with you later uh, to see if you're able to um, actually use some of this information. So I'm going to pause to see if there's anything in the chat or if we should okay. move forward. Great. Um, again, don't hesitate to use the chat to ask questions um, or share information. So we're going to begin with just a, a very brief uh, overview about why this is important in the first place. So why do we need accessible documents? So the, the first point um, and is that disability impacts all of us. So uh, the uh, I, I've, I've got a picture there uh, from the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, they have an infographic talking about the prevalence um, of people with disabilities in the United States. And so the first uh, thing they report is approximately 61 million adults in the United States live with a disability. And the picture shows a map of the United States uh, with stick figures representing people with disabilities uh, and people without disabilities. Um, and you can see that approximately uh, a quarter of uh, the people um, who are shaded in blue uh, representing people with disabilities um, um, are spread across the United States, but it's, uh, some estimates are about 20%. This is from the Centers, Disease, from Disease Centers for Disease Control, and they estimate about one in four um, adults in the United States have some type of disability. Uh, there's also one other uh, um, uh, point that they make is that the percentage of people living with disabilities is, is higher in the South. Um, so there's wide differences uh, in different regions, um, even within Vermont. Um, uh, different regions um, have more people that identify as having disabilities. So, uh, so first of all, Many people have disabilities, maybe more than you think, um, and not all disabilities are visible. So when you're thinking about making a document or really anything accessible, um, you might not know that you're actually already uh, serving or supporting or reaching out to people with disabilities. Um, so planning for accessibility um, at, the, at the outset is a great idea. Um, also, many people with disabilities don't request accommodations. So just because somebody hasn't asked you for um, an accommodation or an accessible document, uh, in this case, it doesn't mean they don't need it um, or wouldn't benefit from it. Um, and the last point is always my favorite point, is that often the solutions that we reach to make things accessible, um, whether they're accessible documents or uh, curb cutouts um, on, on sidewalks, uh, can really benefit many people um, or even everyone. Um, <laughs> So if that didn't convince you, well, it's also the law. Um, and there's a number of uh, United States laws uh, and regulations, and also increasingly international um, guidelines and regulations um, that simply say this is the right thing to do um, as, a, as a civil rights issue. Um, so I'm not going to give a history lesson um, on each of these laws. This is a, a, a webinar focused on uh, practice, and we're going to get to that. Uh, but I do want to highlight uh, just some of the primary ones there. From the Rehabilitation Act 
Um, it was introduced in 1973. The primary purpose was uh, focusing on um, uh, eliminating discrimination uh, for people with disabilities. Um, and a big part of that is making sure um, that reasonable accommodations are offered um, and you know, writ large, we, we make uh, services and supports accessible. The focus was on the federal government um, but as a university that receives public funds, uh, we uh, also need to follow it as well. Most relevant for this is Section 508, which specifically talks about um, electronic uh, information uh, and technology um, that needs to be accessible. So if for some reason you need to tell people exactly what the issue is, or if you hear someone talk about Section 508, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about this law. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act um, is uh, a broader and more recent uh, piece of legislation. Um, uh, again, the primary purpose is to um, identify um, supporting people uh, with disabilities as a, as a civil right. Um, uh, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines um, is um, sounds like something that might not be relevant for this. I know we've got uh, some people. Uh, the design websites um, on this on this call right now. That's not the focus of this, but these guidelines actually uh, govern um, electronic documents as well. Um, in fact, uh, recent updates um, from some of our federal laws are pointing to these specific uh, guidelines as the way that you make things accessible. So the guidelines are not law, but they are pointed to in law. So they, they hold a lot of weight. And you can see they've been updated uh, a few times over the years. Um, and then finally, just mentioning the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. This is an, um, the United Nations, of course, is an international body. Um, unfortunately, the United States is uh, one of the few countries to not ratify um, this UN Convention, uh, which means we're not beholden uh, to it. Um, but among many, many things, it does speak uh, to the importance of accessible uh, documents. Um, so that's writ large at the United States and international level. Uh, so let's talk about University of Vermont. Uh, it, it is uh, accessibility, I believe, is, is, uh, is essential uh, to our mission. Um, so our mission statement as a university begins with to create, evaluate, share, and apply knowledge. So if you're doing those things in a non-accessible way, um, you're not able uh, to generate and share that knowledge uh, to everyone. Um, and of course, uh, maybe even uh, what people would point to more often when we talk about uh, uh, inclusivity um, is that it's part of our common ground. Um, so in terms of uh, respect and integrity, openness, uh, justice, or responsibility and innovation, uh, accessibility doesn't live in any one um, of those tenets of our common ground. I believe it's um, uh, part of all of them. The last point that I want to make is uh, disability is diversity. Um, so again, focusing on, on the University of Vermont, um, the framework that we're using is called inclusive excellence. And it has four pillars, and specifically the third one is focused on our environment. And to quote from it, uh, UVM strives to create physical, virtual, and educational living, learning, and work environments that are inclusive and accessible to all in our community. So when you think about how often one of the main way, ways that we are sharing information and communicating with folks is using Microsoft Word um, and PowerPoint, um, it becomes uh, pretty indispensable uh, for us to be successful uh, with our inclusive excellence goals. Um, and then the last point that I wanna make about why focus on accessibility, um, and again, keeping it focused on UVM, so stealing our, um, our, our motto, so access can move mountains. Um, and I have a quote here from Steve Krug uh, that says, uh, accessibility is profoundly the right thing to do. How many opportunities do we have to dramatically improve people's lives just by doing our job a little better? So probably everyone on this webinar and maybe most people at the University of Vermont use Microsoft Word. Uh, maybe not quite as many, but many of us do use PowerPoint. It's you really can you do what you're doing already um, in a few more, um, uh, more mindful ways uh, to promote um, accessibility. The logo that you see there uh, says access is love uh, and the O is replaced by a, a red heart. And 
uh, this is a uh, uh, this is a, a logo from the people that offer um, a biennial um, disability intersectionality summit um, that are specifically looking at disability as a diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, issue. And they've got a great logo and it makes this final point better than I am. So that's why I put it in here. So now I'm going to transition to our next section, uh, which is how do I start and also transition back to Jean. Thank you, everyone. We're we're literally switching switching seats here um, to try to mess things up as little as possible while we do this. Um, I am excited to uh, continue to talk about um, some of the ways that we can really work with um, digital access um, and um, make sure that we're um, we're putting ourselves in the best position to um, to move forward. And I'm just going to ask one question. Do you have, have your notes been showing up on this? Um, no, I didn't oh, see notes. Oh, OK. Um, um, that is going to be interesting. Oh, no, they're still there. OK, so um, so the first thing that we're going to talk about um, when we're looking at um, Microsoft Word and PowerPoint today um, is the things that we can do on the that very, very basic level that's going to put us put us ahead. Um, we have a very diverse group of people who are attending this today. I'm really excited to see so much representation throughout the university. Um, I'm really excited to see that this is a topic that so many people are interested in. Um, and I also know that some of this may seem like it's basic knowledge to you, or it may seem like it isn't exactly quite lined up with what you do. So. Um, as we get into a lot of this nitty gritty stuff, I just want to make sure that you're all um, okay with just being open to, to going back to what you may consider a basic um, or trying to think of things in, in um, a slightly different lens um, to, to ensure better access throughout um, throughout our, our resources here. So um, the first item is to update your software and your file types. Um, I know that it can be annoying to see the little reminder that you have updates to do and you don't really want to spend 20 minutes or possibly 40 minutes or maybe it's only three minutes. You don't know and you don't want to take that risk um, to, to get your, your applications up to date on your, um, your devices, but it really does make a difference when we're talking about um, accessibility. So specifically with Word and PowerPoint, um, as UVM employees, we have access to these applications for free. Um, and we can keep on getting updated versions of them. Newer versions of these applications have um, much more enhanced accessibility features. Um, and we really encourage everyone to make sure that they're, um, they're putting their best foot forward um, in this pretty, uh, pretty simple step. Um, it will save yourself a lot of redundancy um, by having to go back into documents after um, any sort of guidelines are updated to then redo stuff that you maybe could have started doing today. Um, so for um, guidelines, we recommend at least um, working with Microsoft Office 2016. Um, there is 2019 available as well now. They do look a little bit different. 2019 does have some extra um, items it's, um, or things are displayed a little bit differently, but um, you'll still have really good, you'll be able to meet your standards well with uh, 2016 software. Um, and similarly, as we have um, applications that are updating, the file types themselves have also started to update. So you may be, um, depending on how, how much you scrutinize your, your files, uh, you may have noticed that a Word document usually is no longer a period DOC, um, but a period DOCX. Um, this change um, also came with a lot of updates. Um, so when you're looking at things as like a, a compatibility mode um, or keeping things in an older version, um, it's not going to 
enhance the document the same way. So some of the accessibility features that are available today will not be present um, in your document. We'll actually take a look at some of that stuff um, a little bit later in this. Um, and then, so this is this is the one one piece that we really want everybody to be focused on um, that like at that very base level. Um, the second is to know your audience. Um, I've listed some pretty basic questions here. Um, as someone who has a communications background, this seems like it makes a lot of sense to me. I, I, I hope that many of you are thinking about this when you're writing, but I also know that it's not necessarily the reality. Um, I know from ex my own experiences that some things that have just started out as an email have then turned into some sort of you know, press release or um, have turned into a news article. And um, when you're writing for different audiences like that, um, you start, your, your tone can start to change. Um, and we want to make sure that we're trying to make things as consistent as possible. Um, so by putting more intention behind these questions, um, you'll be setting yourself up for success with clear organization, um, you know who you're targeting, and you'll be in a better practice to think about how to remove potential barriers before they're actually in somebody's way. Um, some things to consider when you're doing this is the appropriate language, um, both in terms of like, are, are you reaching out to English speakers? Um, or you see, uh, reaching out to people who are maybe learning English, um, but also the, the level, um, are you a faculty member who is reaching out to um, someone who also has a PhD in the same field? Are you reaching out to community members, first year students, the list goes on. Um, also think about the length, how long you can hold somebody's attention, um, what is going to just kind of inundate someone with too much information and then also the appearance um how are you using images are you using images lists um anything like white space on a page um these all kind of play an important role in um in enhancing comprehension and also um, increasing retention so um, as office continues to update your audience is also probably going to evolve. So um, it's always important to kind of come back to these, even if you are in the same position that you've been in for 10 years. Um, if you're still working with students, we know that your students are also evolving and their needs and the way that they, um, they comprehend is going to be different. So um, always think about even, you know, um, as basic as it may seem, really kind of come back to these kinds of questions. So um, who are you trying to reach with this information? Why do you need to share this? And what do you want someone to learn from this document? Okay, so once we have a better grasp on um, that audience and we all agree to stop ignoring all those updates on our computers, um, we can start to look at more of the, the, the nitty gritty stuff. Um, we're going to spend the majority of the training addressing content and structure um, in documents and um, as Jesse and I were talking about how to create this, um, we realized that these two things have to be going um, kind of side by side instead of really thinking about your content and your structure separately. Um, it um, is really helpful when you're thinking about access um, to, to be thinking more in tandem with these instead of trying to um, just take take all the words that you have and then put them into a format. Um, it, as we think about like principles of universal design, really kind of coming at this from all angles is going to help. Um, so I'm gonna take this a little water first. We're first gonna look and talk about plain language. Um, I've pulled from plainlanguage.gov um, one of the basic definitions of it, plain language, also called plain writing or plain English, is communication your audience can understand the first time they read or hear it. So when we're thinking about that, um, plain language can look a little bit differently to different groups, um, but we really want to make sure that we're being as open and ready with our information as we possibly can. Um, we want um, like we want to have plain language because it will it will invite the most amount of people to understand your content 
um, at the, the most basic level. So um, it's also going to make the document more adaptable. Um, even if you have a very specific audience in mind, it will be easier to adjust it to a broader audience um, if you are already free of jargon or other specialized language. Um, some things to consider while thinking about plain language is um, avoiding a lot of acronym use. And I know, especially in higher education, that's a tricky, tricky task. Um, I say that coming from CCI. We figure out this out. Okay, I say that coming from CDCI, which is a USED from the AUCD network um, at UVM in CES. Um, we have we have a lot of we have a lot of um, acronyms that can really trip people up and pull away from somebody's um, somebody's focus. So when we're looking at plain language, um, beyond using um, just simple simple words um, you can also be thinking about how to um, how to check this so um, if you're using Microsoft Word you can check on reading uh, readability statistics um, some of you may be familiar with the flesh Kincaid um, scale which will give a grade level to the work that um, that you're looking at um, there's also a reading ease level um, passive sentence use um, I know some of this sounds like sixth grade grammar class, but um, these things do detract from our ability to think about um, new content in a straight line. Yes, we have a question. We do. Um, <coughs> so, um, you, you, you use the term specialized language. Mm -hmm. um, so the question was exactly what does that mean? Um, so specialized language um, in the way that I'm thinking about it right now is um, language that's really specific to your own field. Um, we, or, 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 jar, or, jar, uh, or jargon, I think um, when we're thinking about um, being in um, special education, um, there are certain words or phrases that um, educators will know immediately, but someone who is not in that field won't. Uh, won't really understand. So trying to find instead of saying like a, the saying a, a paraeducator, um, having um, a more um, descriptive word choice and um, that that someone who doesn't know what a paraeducator could be. So um, someone who helps out in a classroom, another um, another educator there um, supporting a teacher and students. Can, um, can I offer another yeah. example? I'm trying to get close enough to the microphone. Um, so one that I've used already in this presentation um, is the term inclusive excellence. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, you, uh, for those reading along, it was um, and, and uh, we capitalized it. Um, but I found increasingly that when I'm talking with community groups about the work that we do related to diversity, equity, inclusion, I start to just say inclusive excellence because that's what we say here at the University of Vermont um, and people don't know what that means. Um, so, uh, making sure that sometimes we need to use terms like that, but if you do, you have to define it. Is that a, is that a good that answer? Is. Good, great. Um, great question. Thank you. Um, so, so yeah, so with plain language, um, avoiding passive sentences um, and wordiness to the um, that like keep it, keep it simple, um, keep it straightforward. We um, we don't have to be dazzling everyone with our our big expensive words. Um, we want to make sure that we our our primary goal is always to to be able to share our information. Um, also, reaching back to our our sixth grade grammar, um, looking at parallel structure and construction. So um, with parallel structure, um, if we're looking at um, the Purdue Online Writing Lab, um, it's looking at using the same pattern of words to show two or more ideas that have the same level of importance. So in a sentence um, that would look like, um, today I woke up, I ate breakfast, I got in my car. Um, we're using the same verb tense. Um, we're keeping our, our word choices 
similar um, and we're not we're not we're not changing too many things. Um, we want to be doing this as well um, in the design of our document um, and templates are really, really helpful um, for making sure that we do that, especially in longer documents. Um, when we'll talk a little bit more about headings um, as we go through this, but it's really going to help, um, help help people from getting lost when they see something that they've recognized um, that's already been in the document. Um, so it will um, it will also help you get organized and stay organized within um, whatever you're creating. Um, and as I said, there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunity for um, for embedding these things or just using templates that already have them embedded for you. So it's a little bit less work for you to stay organized. I know that um, some of the intimidation factor around um, moving to more, towards more accessible documents is the the time that it's going to take. Um, it can be it can be overwhelming to think about having to change documents that you've already put a lot of heart and soul into. Um, or thinking about that entire task list that you have in front of you and trying to figure out how you're going to insert new skills into this. Um, keeping these kinds of elements um, accessible also means keeping them very well organized for yourself. Um, it, will, it will really help you um, in, in your planning and um, in your document manipulation if you already have, um, if you already have a structure decided on. Okay. Ooh. Okay. So as we're we're starting to talk about structure, I'm just gonna lay out some of the um, the elements that we're going to be talking about today. Um, formatting is where a lot of people can start to feel stuck or intimidated, um, especially when we're creating new content. Um, and we don't really know how it affects accessibility. Um, so I know everybody in here has had at least one bad experience with a page break in Word. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have some, some eye rolls across the table, so I'm hoping that you guys agree online as well. Um, and um, I know that those trying to um, use new, new formatting skills or options in, in Microsoft can, um, can be terrifying. Um, but we really do advocate for them because they do add another layer of um, accessibility that um, we may not be able to see visually, um, but that are really important um, for someone who is, um, is not accessing a document um, visually. So um, we also encourage this because it will, um, make your your documents look more organized they'll look pretty um, and they'll still be accessible um, so we're gonna i broke these down into um to two two sub lists um we're gonna start talking about like layout content so we're gonna be looking at just um digital document information we're gonna talk about reading order headings tables and lists um i know this um, a lot of a lot of the people who came in with um, either examples of work that they wouldn't mind sharing with our group um, or people with questions, these were a lot of what those, um, both of those kind of looked at. Um, and then we're also gonna look at our formatting. Um, how, do we, how do we hyperlink within our documents? Um, what do we do with images? What about our font styles and sizes and color contrast? So starting out, um, with document information, we want to um, go go pretty pretty basic. This isn't this isn't too much information, but these are all important pieces. We want to make sure that your document has a title, um, that it has a set language, um, and that it is in a correct and updated file type. So the document title, um, a lot of times screen readers um, will just automatically take whatever your file name is and just use that as a document title. Um, we are going to talk too much about PDFs today because it is, um, it's very complicated and um, we, we only have two hours, but um, title is one of the common errors that will pop up um, 
a missing title is a common error that will pop up from, um, from an accessibility check on PDFs because it doesn't necessarily automatically pull a title in. Um, it's really simple, bless you, to, to um, rename. And um, this is also, it's um, very helpful for screen readers instead of having to read out a file name, especially if it's like a download off of the internet um, with a lot of characters um, or version 78 saved on November the 3rd, 2019. Um, it can bypass some of that that language and that um, redundancy um, and just give give what the actual title um, should be. Um, setting language is important also for screen readers. Um, I know that, again, if we're just looking at a document and we're typing words in English, um, all, we can assume that it is in English. Um, we, um, Microsoft Office products do a very good job of automatically um, putting in a language type, but um, there are instances where it's not. Um, and then file type again, we want to make sure that um, we're, we're using updated versions of that. Um, so for this, I'm actually going to exit out of our slideshow so I can look at um, an example. Bear with me while we do this uh, transition for a second. Um, other questions coming in at all while I putz around here for a second? <laughs> Um, yes. Okay. Thank you, Cindy. Um, so, uh, while you're focused on that, Jean, uh, so Cindy asked, uh, are you are you saying that adding a title will override a screen reader reading the file name? Um, that's a good question, Cindy. It depends on the, the context of where it's reading it. Um, so before the document is open, it can't read the title. Yes. Right. Correct. Yeah. So it's yeah. So yeah. If your your operating system, if it has a screen reader uh, running, would be telling the um, the user what's on the screen. Um, so before the document's open, it can read the, the file name. I think if you pull up more information, you could access the title. Uh, but certainly when you open the document. Um, one of the other. Um, features right now that um, I think is new in 2009. No, wow, we're not in 2009. <laughs> in 2019's <laughs> Office products. Um, <laughs> really reliving my glory days here. Um, is that um, if you are hyperlinking to another document within a file, um, it will automatically pull the title um, and embed it as the hyperlink instead of, um, instead of having to go through um, your file slash documents, et cetera, et cetera. Um, OK, so on the screen now, I hope everybody can see um, the Master of Social Work Admissions Bulletin 2019 through 2020. Um, thank you again, everybody that um, sent in some documents. Um, I'm really excited to be using them. Um, and. Um, I know I know that can be scary sometimes, so we, we really appreciate your, your courage. Um, I wanted to share this because, um, as we know, this is, this is something that has been recently updated. Um, this is for this school year. Um, but if you look at the top of the screen here, you can see that this is a um, MSW ADM Bulletin 2019 to 2020. And then in brackets, you see compatibility mode. Um, so what that means is that this file was, um, created in a different version of Microsoft Word and it is still retaining all of the presets, um, and formatting that, um, it was originally created with. Um, you can still see up top that there are some, there are still some formatting um, options that we that we use pretty regularly. You can see there's um, some heading options, which we'll talk about soon. I'm very excited about headings. Um, you have a styles pane, um, but if you go into um, Word, Word's general um, menu, and if we wanted to check the accessibility of this document, we'll get a panel that comes up with the accessibility checker in it. 
and says inspection results, and then it says cannot check the current file type for accessibility issues. So this document pre exists or predates um, the accessibility features of Microsoft, and so therefore cannot add in, um, it, and it cannot it cannot scan for for potential issues. Um, because it, it doesn't have the capacity to. Um, I sh should have checked this before, but I forgot to. Um, so one of the other things that we can see, um, adding alt text to images is really um, important for accessibility. And I do not see an option here. Um, I don't even see the um, picture panel coming up. So. These are these are some so you can still insert images, but um, any of the metadata that you want to be attached to it is is not available. So um, for for questions. So, so Jean, just want to ask you're, you're starting to use um, some technical terms, uh, which is great because uh, mm -hmm. you're having fun. Um, but so uh, metadata, um, alt text, we haven't mm -hmm. talked about yet. Haven't. So I just I just want to <laughs> reassure folks that these are all things that we're going to that Gene's going to talk about it more uh, and more specific. Right now, your main point is about the file type. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. So um, with saving this in compatibility mo mode, um, we don't have the option to add in any of the things that we haven't taught you how to do yet. <laughs> um, so. And, and I'm sorry. So we've, uh, so we've got a, a question here. So is is one of the take home messages that the bulletin itself needs to be um, recreated in a newer version of Word? Um, like, does it need to be recreated or, or opened in a new version and saved as a new version? Um, having, from my experience, and um, there may be a way to do it that I don't know, it is far easier um, to recreate it. But um, it's not, I, I know that that sounds scary because this is a lengthy document, but you can um, select all, copy, and put it into a new Word document. You can just paste it straight in, and then when uh, you save as, all of the features that you didn't have available in this version um, will then become available. So, so it sounds like what you're saying is you don't have to start over from square one. Right. Um, but when you when you do copy and paste it into a new document that has the ability to access the accessibility features, mm -hmm. that you might have some fixing to do. Yeah. Um, from Again, um, I haven't done this. Um, I'm, I'm I'm not from Microsoft. I, I can't um, I can't say exactly how it all works. But from my own experience in working with um, documents that were in this compatibility mode with this issue, I haven't had to fix any formatting yet. Um, I think that once um, once it is in an updated version, there may be some other items for accessibility purposes that may have to be. Um, readjusted some formatting may have to change for that but the formatting itself everything has has stayed the same i know that's always um it's always scary when you you've figured out your margins perfectly or your table to get all the words in one line um that all stays when you copy and paste it great question um so kuni had a follow-up and she said i believe that you can open and resave it with the most updated word version so if you have the latest version of Word, and then you open this older document, and then save as um, all the way at the top, the dot v o c x. So you get a you get a nice warning that you're about to change the file type, uh, and that's what you were doing intentionally. Mm -hmm. So having done that, it definitely messed up with um, it definitely messed with some of the formatting okay but um, but can we can we check now so if we go to review and then accessibility and look okay, at that it is there good yep okay. so so Cooney that was exactly right so now you're actually able to use the accessibility checker um, and then we probably don't want to play with the images yet because mm -hmm. we haven't gotten to that section um, but my mm -hmm. guess um, is that you would then be able to yeah do the individual steps that we're gonna that Gene is gonna discuss in more detail. Mm -hmm. um, so not starting from square one. Mm -hmm. We have one other question in the room. Yes. So um, I'm kind of looking at a document on my own screen, and I just want to point out the 
I don't know if it's a version of Word I have or because I'm on a PC instead of a Mac, but getting to the accessibility checker looks a lot different for me. I didn't know yes. we were gonna cover that. Yes, um, we, will, we will talk about that. Thank you um, uh, for raising that point. Um, Jesse and I are both Mac users, um, so this document um, or this this presentation is um, is looking at most of mostly just through um, what it looks like on a Mac operating system, um, but we will talk about how to make sure you can do all these things on PC as well. Yes, and this this is Jesse again, and and just want to highlight because of our limited time um, and probably on this this webinar we have many different versions mm -hmm. of word and powerpoint uh, that's why the, f the first message was was update so mm -hmm. <laughs> we all have access as UVM employees to um, 2019 the the features for accessibility are better um, so I know I, and myself included it's hard to upgrade because they move where everything is <laughs> um, but that's that's the first take home message uh, the second is we we don't have time uh, today to talk about all of the differences. So the features we're talking about are consistent across Macs and PCs. Exactly where you find them um, uh, could be slightly different. Some of the resources and links that we're going to provide um, uh, have much more detail um, and even step-by-step -step checklists for looking at some of these things, including examples for if you've got Word 2019 on a PC, this is where you go. And if you've got Word 2019 on a Mac, this is where you go. Um, so don't don't get too lost in, in the details. Um, Gene's gonna demo it so you can see it, um, so you can see it happen, but the features may be a little bit different depending on what your computer looks like and how up-to-date it is. Okay. All right, um, I'm gonna keep on moving along. Um, so next, we're going to talk about reading order. Um, on the slide here, I um, took a screenshot of one of our own um, slides for this presentation um, and put it out into um, a, a view where you see each layer of the slide um, under the arrangement feature. And um, reading order, um, Reading order denotes how how screen uh, how a screen reader will go through a document. Um, if you are using um, primarily your your vision um, to to scan a document, um, you read. We read. We've been trained to read in very specific ways, um, and we will use visual cues on a page to decide what to read next. Um, but a screen reader as, as a machine has to, has to follow a path. So we have to make sure that we're putting that path in correctly. Um, templates, again, um, can really help with reading order. Um, in fact, in newer versions of PowerPoint, um, you can search through their template options. You can just put in the word accessible and it will pull up some of the, um, the most accessible templates for you. And it has um, it has really good outlines for for the slide structure, which will then translate into um, into uh, how a screen reader reads it. Um, it um, um, in Word documents, um, it will default to being read um, the same way that we would be reading um, reading a, a printed page. Um, so usually left from right, top to bottom. Um, but it can change when items like text boxes or tables are added. Um, we'll go in a little bit more depth um, with those features in just another couple of minutes. But um, a good rule to follow is um, to use structural items the way that they are intended to be used and not in a way that um, basically, uh, quote unquote, tricks the application into making content look a certain way. Um, so when I say that, I'm talking about um, tabbing over to the midpoint of, of a document space um, to make it appear that there's two columns instead of using like the, the column feature. Um, and um, for PowerPoint, um, using templates again will be, um, will be really helpful. You can also, um, I will show you how to get to this view um, in PowerPoint so that you can see how the order um, is going to be displayed. Um, PowerPoint, 
will read from the bottom most layer, or it will tell a screen reader re to read from the most bottom layer um, all the way up to the top. So um, let's look, let's look first at um, PowerPoint. So I'm going to exit out of here again. Do we have more questions coming in or? Uh, there, there's, there have been a few questions um, that folks have asked in chat um, okay. about Office and older versions, and I've been trying to respond to those questions um, in chat. Okay. Um, they're, they're, they're great ones. Okay. So thank you, Hope and Thomas. Um, so I'm pulling up um, another another PowerPoint that was uh, submitted by you guys um, from College of Nursing, College of Nursing and Health Sir, uh, Sciences. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, and looking, so um, again, we're we're using we're using a Mac here. Um, but what you want to do is you want to find uh, the arrange tab. Um, you have for Mac users, it's under your your home tab, um, and you have two items that I want to show you. You first have your selection pane, um, which will show you your items um, just by title, and when you click on them, they will um, be highlighted on the actual slide itself. Um, and you can move these; they're manipulative. Uh, manipulatable. Um, and then um, if that, if you have a lot of content um, and you have a lot of objects on your slide, that may be a little bit tedious. Um, you can also look um, through the reorder objects. And that's that view um, that I have a screenshot of. So um, again, it will read from the bottom to the top. Bottom um, is usually our, our title slide, and then the, the slides after that um, will be our content. Um, and these are also draggable. Okay. And um, for PC users, this is um, it's the same phrasing. Um, the way you navigate there may be a little bit different, um, especially in uh, more up-to-date versions of Office, it's um, their their search function is very helpful for finding these items. Um, so not the search and presentation, um, but when you go back up to your um, uh, to your main window um, under, I don't think that um, PCs have the help. I think it may just be an actual search icon. Um, you can. You can also be putting in um, uh, you can search and I already forgot the name of it reorder objects um, and it will show you how to get there okay all right um, and then I also wanted to give one example um, as I'm speaking um with oh. just if you have a question just when you entered the um the ordering uh page mm -hmm. uh, the captioning uh, was no longer visible oh I'm thank sorry. you rachel thank you rachel i will make sure that i click on that um, is the captioning visible now great okay i'm pulling up one more One more example. Maybe I'm not. Um, so Anne's in the room. I'm gonna pick on I'm gonna pick on Anne. We're looking at um, a save the date. Can you are the captions still displaying? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, a save the date from our, our best project, um, which is a Word document. And we have um, down here, um, again, if, you're, if you are um, accessing this visually, um, you see a really nicely organized um, keynote speaker uh, panel, and then you also have 
um, two columns with um, one with anticipated strands for everybody and then Wednesday morning workshops. Um, if we are to go behind the scenes here, um, you'll see that this is actually a table. And then above the table, we have um, another, uh, we have a couple of different objects um, that are that are hanging out. I think there's a secondary table in here. I can't find it though. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Um, or a word box or a text box. So um, we've achieved a really nice layout visually here um, by by using a table and um, separating our content in a way that um, the the human eye will understand. But a screen reader will have a really hard time navigating this and wouldn't be able to pick it up in the correct order. Um, so, so this is the kind of um, the this is the these are the items that maybe um, maybe a new change for you. Um, but we can um, we can talk about how to make these kinds of things um, still have that same formatting that we like visually, um, but we'll also then tell a screen reader to, to read the same way. So using columns um, in, in this space instead of a table um, could be helpful. Um, and again, we all know that, that page breaks are, um, are challenging <laughs> with Word documents, um, but having a keynote speakers uh, section be separate and then having, having a two column area will, um, will make this, um, We'll make this layout a little bit nicer, or by making this um, a visual table with some headers. But I'm getting ahead of myself, um, so I'm going to switch back to our PowerPoint. While you do that, there's mm -hmm. been a, a couple questions. <clears throat> uh, so uh, first, Hope um, is pointing out a, a challenge um, that is run into with courses here. Mm -hmm. um, and so you've written things we've run into working with faculty files using Blackboard Allies. They may choose an accessible template, but they um, don't choose a slide uh, layout from the new slide list. Mm. So they start with a blank slide and then add text boxes to it. And so when you do that, um, you you don't you're you're not taking advantage of um, the um, the built-in features of, of 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 PowerPoint, which sort of more logically create um, the reading order. So if you use the template, it'll, uh, it'll start with the title and then it'll move to the first content area <laughs> for the slide that Jean has up right now. It's a layout um, that has two content areas. And so those are the two columns there. Mm -hmm. It'll read the one on the left and then go to the one on the right. Um, so it does it in a logical order. But if you create those text boxes um, yourself, it'll, and Jean, correct me if I'm wrong, it'll read it in the order that you created it or the reverse order. It just, to, Suffice it to say, it'll it'll do it in an order you may not expect. Mm -hmm. So you can still do that. You don't have to be beholden to the templates, but it does mean you have more work to do to check the reading order um, uh, after the fact to make sure things are in the right order because it might start reading um, the, the wrong section uh, before you get started. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a question, that are UVM's PowerPoint templates uh, accessible? So you can see today uh, that we are using uh, some slides uh, from UVM's templates. Um, and I think, do you, do you want to say like a, a general message about templates, uh, which is they're, they're not <laughs> yeah, I, they're agnostic. Uh, right. So um, that both of these are great questions and um, they're, they're going straight where, where this presentation is headed. So that's lovely. I'm going to answer. Um, I'm going to answer the question about the, the templates first. Um, templates are good tools for accessibility, um, but there are always ways to make them inaccessible. Um, with the UVM template that we have, um, I agree with, with Jesse. Um, we, we are using very specific, um, very specific slides. Um, and the, I, the answer is yes and no. It really depends on how you are using the slides um, and what, what you're trying to present within them. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the um, some common issues in presentations and um, just general accessibility issues um, 
that can happen. They aren't necessarily going to happen when we're using the, the UVM um, PowerPoint template. Um, but but yeah, there are there are some some ways that we would just want to make sure people are are using it in, in an informed manner. Um, I um, yeah. So going back to the question more specifically about um, about like how how you are using your your PowerPoints, um, we're we're going to switch into talking about headings um, and in PowerPoint. Um, we are very much like very sp slide specific within your headings. In Word documents, um, our, our headings, same with um, on websites, they can, they can um, carry throughout an entire document. Um, PowerPoint structure is only going to be on one slide. So there are, there are fewer options. Um, usually you'll see a title slide, a title and content. Um, sometimes you'll also see section headers. Um, so I'll go out really quickly. Oh, this is going to hopefully not mess too many things up. Where am I? OK, so this is the presentation that um, Jesse and I are giving right now, um, which is done in UVM's template. Um, you have, you have uh, this button up here is for, for layout options. And you can see we have we have a ton of options um, for this template. They've um, they've really made sure that we um, we can express ourselves with um, a lot of style, um, and that we have options to fit the needs of whatever it is we're presenting. Um, and this may be a little bit too difficult to to see, um, but each layout also has a description underneath it. Um, so we have title and content one. Um, we have three custom layout, um, and yeah, we have more more title and content. Um, yeah, so all of all of the we also have some blank options. Or did you add those in? <laughs> I think they may have been there. Ooh, I'm changing things. Um, so um, as you can see, we we see a lot of the title and content. If we were to create a new template, or sorry, a new presentation with just a, a blank template, um, you'll see a couple of other options um, for slides, which is just essentially like a section header. But again, um, a screen reader is only looking at one slide at a time. So um, the continuity doesn't have to be as precise between your slides. So, so if you're doing a title versus a section, it's not that that much of a, um, a big deal. Um, but what is on the page is really important. So um, yeah, by changing, um, because we have so many options, especially in our UVM template, I would recommend trying to find a template or a slide layout that best fits what you need to put on the slide. Um, all the time so um, so that there's less manipulation that you're going to have to do after um, by by arranging. Um, does, that, does that answer those questions? I think. Uh, yes, okay. um, so there, there's a, a new question, but just so for the entire PowerPoint presentation, mm -hmm. this is from Amy, uh, we have to select the style uh, for each slide, uh, yes. Um, no, you can you can select a theme um, and uh, for for your whole presentation, um, and it'll give you um, some some default options that are part of that template. The layout uh, for each slide um, you would choose uh, for each slide. So how things are organized on the page. Um, <clears throat> okay, so for for word headings, um, we have, as I said, these are going to carry through an entire document. Oh, I should be presenting this. <laughs> run, run multiple screens. OK. Um, it, yeah, your, your, your headings are going to um, be present throughout the entire document. Um, it's not just going to be looking at um, a specific um, just a specific page. Um, so we want to make sure that those things are consistent throughout. Um, 
one of the biggest um, challenges for for headings is making sure that we're using them properly and that they're nested in the correct order. Um, and people who have done um, web work are probably a little bit more familiar with those concepts because this is the same when you're developing web pages as well. Um, but we want to make sure that we have, um, if we are using a heading number one, um, and then we have a, 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 a title that is um, underneath it. Here, I'm going to end the show again and come back. Um, let's, I'm going to stay in um, our admin bullet. Um, so I would, I would consider the department introduction, history, and mission statement. This would probably be a, a primary header. Um, and then we have an introduction, which could be a secondary header. Um, you can see already that um, the folks who designed this are keeping that parallel construction between their subheadings. And then um, when they're going back to their primary heading, um, it's again the same construction. Um, these haven't been um, in in Word, they haven't been assigned as headings. Um, when I'm uh, highlighting all of this, you can see that um, it's still acknowledging it as just normal text. Um, but if I were to call it a heading one, right now it is going to change the font because of the presets that I have on there. But it will now be understood that this is a heading one. Um, and this would be a heading two. So, um, my first point is going to be about nesting, making sure that we're nesting these. And I know that people probably have some questions about changing, changing the look of these as well. Um, since we had a heading one, we want to make sure that we're going straight into a heading two and we're not skipping that heading. Um, this document, I don't believe goes further than what we would want for a heading two. Um, we would want to make sure that if we do have um, a next level heading that we're always following um, following that order um, of not going back up a level of heading or not going back down to a level of heading that's um, that's skipping anything. Um, question. Well, so so Jean, uh, so because uh, I'm trying to man the chat uh, mm -hmm. as as well, I might have uh, missed this. Um, but when you when you're talking about headings, when I think about headings, um, and I've had to do my own learning mm -hmm. uh, around using them, especially the, you know, I, I, uh, not just making them look like headings, but actually telling Microsoft Word that this is heading level number one, this is heading level two. Mm -hmm. um, the way I think about them is as an outline. Mm -hmm. Have you already mentioned that? Or I haven't. Yeah. yeah. So when you're talking about parallel construction, really think 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 about you you organize your document um, with an outline. So your, your, your top level um, headings uh, refer to the top level content that you're going to have. Um, so I don't know how many are in here or not. Um, but um, uh, so secondary things that are nested, as you're saying, within each of those broader things are just sort of, you know, your next level, your lower level in your outline. Um, so to me, this is, this is one of those features that um, is, <coughs> is really helpful for getting organized before you create your document is really helpful when you're creating your document for accessibility. Um, and then also um, can be really helpful for um, creating, using other options in, in, in Microsoft Word, like actually creating an outline or a table of contents. Thank you, Jesse. Um, <laughs> so when um, I agree. This is this is one of those ways that like really um, you can really prioritize your own organization. You will save yourself a lot of time in the long run. Um, I also know as someone who sometimes likes to try to just like work through things as quickly as possible and then you know format as I go kind of thing. Um, it can um, it can wind up taking a lot more time to. Um, to do so, especially um, even from like a design standpoint, if you decide halfway through an item that you want to change what your what one of your headings looks like, um, if 
you have it um, tagged as a heading, it will be a little bit easier to go through and make that change all at once um, versus having to go back through and find every version of it in your in your document and then go back through and change it. So I do want to introduce you. Um, I think as Jesse had mentioned in the um, in the description of this webinar, this isn't necessarily um, you know a how to on Microsoft products. Um, so th this may take some of your own um, your own learning to to get comfortable with some of the formatting options. Um, but I do want to just mention that like this the styles pane um, is where you can make all of these all of these changes. Microsoft Word has options um, to go from heading level one to heading level nine. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a document with that many heading levels, um, but but you do have the option to do so. Um, and in the style pane, you also have the option to um, to change some of your other um, again more uh, aesthetic um, focused um, text. Um, so you can you have the options to modify styles, and you also have the options to add new styles here. Um, I would recommend um, taking a couple of minutes if you already know that you tend to write in a specific font, um, if you know that you tend to generate a lot of documents that have you know, three levels of titling, um, to just take a couple of minutes and add these into your <laughs> default settings so you just have them. And every time that you're writing, um, you can just automatically, you can just start using them. It's a click of a button instead of having to highlight different clumps of text over and over again to change it. Okay. And we'll get back to our presentation. Okay. So now we're going to move on to tables, which um, I, I know can be um, a contentious item in especially in Microsoft Word. <laughs> um, we have, uh, or I say we, I'm thinking about the conversations I've had with people in this room, um, can have difficulty formatting tables um, when we want them to have text elements in them, especially. Um, we want to make sure that they fit on our page as well. Um, and that can be tricky. But we really have to remember what the purpose of a table is, and that's to organize um, groups of data. So um, that has to that has to keep our our priority. Um, some do's and don'ts for table accessibility um, include avoiding using a cell split or merge, um, as well as having empty cells. So if you have something um, that is either going to be um, used to like, or if there's if there's not like a, a, a value assigned to a table yet, um, using things like a, a dash or a zero to indicate that, that that cell does have something there is going to be helpful for a screen reader. Um, we also want to use heading rows. Um, which will help a screen reader understand um, and tell a user um, what is going to be in that row, what the content is um, that they can that we can look through. So, and again, this is also really helpful for organization. Um, I think both in having someone read your table, you do want to make sure that you're being as transparent as possible about what is what it is that they're looking at. How are we collecting um, this data and how are we organizing it? Um, but also um, for for your own um, creating to make sure that you are putting content in where it belongs um, and having headache, having headings um, is really going to hold you accountable to do that. Um, so um, this image right here on on the slide is just a blank table. So um, that's that's not that's not very accessible. Um, it, a screen reader wouldn't really know what to do with this. Um, but I wanted to show you that you can still have um, you, 
you still can use some of the the, the features um, that enhance it stylistically. Um, having having some of those branded colors in there can help. Having the different shading between rows um, helps um, make sure that you're keeping your your eye on which um, which row you're looking at. Um, and yeah, um, I know I know that they can be intimidating, um, but the more that you get comfortable, the more that you use them, the more comfortable you will get with them. Um, no questions? Okay, great. Um, why can't I? There we go. So I, I think one thing I, I, I might have heard you say, and I definitely saw it in the captioning, um, it was mentioned branded uh, rows, mm -hmm. but I, I think we're talking about banded rows, and that's just the alternating colors. Or are you also talking about UV? And I was colors? also talking about how it is another, it's a stylistic feature that you can also incorporate your branding. So your, your color palette can be um, can be showed. But we did we did talk about having different um, banded rows. Banded rows. <laughs> yes, which I did not call banded. Um, thank you for, for that. Um, yeah, to to help that that will help um, yeah, everyone just um, make sure that they're following on the correct row. Um, so Sarah's just asked a, a great question. So do screen readers note uh, what background color the cell is on a table? They do not. Uh, not at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so so color is one of the topics you're about to. Yeah, uh, is, is we're, coming we're up, getting so, there. <laughs> so, stay, so stay tuned for that. But it's it's a it's a major concern for accessibility. Yes. Um, there's another question. What if a table header refers to two columns? Is it OK to merge it into a header that spans them? So that's a great question. Um, and this is um, this is a it's cha this is challenging for me um, as someone who's used tables and like to use tables in a very specific way for uh, for most of my time creating tables um, to see that it doesn't necessarily line up with what a best practice is. Um, you, when we're merging tables, the, or sorry, when we're merging cells, um, the issue becomes that a screen reader um, loses count of what cell that it is on. Um, so if you um, if you have one header that is describing then two columns. Um, it it will get confused about like which which it's actually describing, or it may um, imprint part of that. On, like, it will it will get the um, the reading order out of out of um, out, like out of askew. So um, my suggestion would be, but I also understand that visually it, it looks nice um, and it feels organized to have that split underneath. Um, the um, what I would say is what your secondary heading would be um, in that in that instance um, should just also include what your your other your primary header would be, um, which is a hard thing to, to articulate and not have a have something to demonstrate. Um, um, well, which is which is a, a great point. So the request was, um, do you have a visual example of an accessible table? versus a non-accessible uh, table. So I think I mean, what we're talking about right now is, um, and I'm gonna try and describe uh, a table using my words uh, rather than visually, Hard. which I think really underscores the challenge here, right? So we, we expect, um, uh, you know, many of us are excited to have a lot of experience looking at tables. We scan them uh, very quickly for pertinent information. And the way we do that is by immediately looking at the um, headers um, and often the rows. Uh, sometimes the rows have their own titles uh, as well. So um, an accessible table and a non-accessible table might look identical, uh, but you haven't identified to Office, uh, either to PowerPoint or to Word in this case, what the header row is um, and what the header uh, what the header column is. So, so, so you got to do that first um, in order to give uh, people who are uh, using a screen reader uh, to describe a table like I'm trying to do now <laughs> um, uh, to, to, to have that. Um, and then the second piece that Gene's describing now in terms of if you use the merge cells feature to combine two cells, if you do that for the header row, um, then they no longer match uh, the columns that fall underneath that header. So you might have what looks like to you one 
column header, but below it there are two columns. So, Gene, what you're describing, I believe, is that a screen reader has trouble with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, a screen. I'm. Uh, I've pulled up um, another example that was sent in. So, thank you again. Um, where we can see um, that in these these um, course offerings, we have um, the what is offered in the fall is a completely merged cell, um, and then we it's differentiated between on campus and on site. Um, so what would happen for screen readers? They'll see that this is one cell. Um, this part is one cell, this part is one cell, this part is one cell, and then it will read this as one cell, and then suddenly there's a second, and it, um, I'm depending on a lot of things that I don't really understand fully, um, it, it may do something differently for the on-site. Um, it may just put it under on campus, um, it may read it out of order, um, or it may, it may figure it out. Um, what I would recommend um, for this, instead of having this all as one table, um, summer could be its own as it only has one cell. Um, everything else that has the on-campus and on-site offerings, I would put fall on-campus and fall on-site. So um, you're taking, you'd be able to eliminate um, that that top heading um, by adding a little bit more description onto the secondary level. Does that make sense? Again, I understand that might not be as um, as pleasing or um, what what we may be used to seeing as far as like our our organization um, and even the redundancy of having fall listed twice may um, may irk you, um, but that will that will be that will ensure better better comprehension. For a screen reader. Um, there, <clears throat> there is another question right now, mm -hmm. but um, Gina, I'm going to let you continue. I'm okay. going to actually look up the, the real answer to that. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, just you know, since, I, since I've interrupted to, to mention <laughs> that, let me just say, um, would the accessibility checker pick up on this? Um, and so, I, we're, so we haven't talked about the accessibility yes. checker um, d directly yet. That's going to come up in just a minute in terms of how you would use it for the documents that you're creating and reviewing. So we'll 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 return to that question uh, then, uh, mm -hmm. because the short version is uh, there are some things that can be automatically captured um, in the accessibility checker, and there's other components that it cannot, and you have mm -hmm. to do a manual review. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll. There, there's actually one of the resources we'll share is a, is a really great checklist to help you do that. So you don't have to remember this or watch the webinar again to get <laughs> that information. So very, very quickly, um, I want to talk about lists. Um, again, we've, we're really harping on that, um, that organizational capacity here. Um, lists help everybody um, and they'll group content in, um, in ways that um, that will um, aid our comprehension, and they also help with that, that um, like word economy. Um, we tend to shorten our sentences or don't use complete sentences in lists, um, which will add to a little bit of like the the breakup on a page um, for for comprehension. That that can be kind of helpful instead of looking at a page that's just really really heavy with text um, to have it. Um, broken up a little bit more is helpful. Um, again, uh, people who use screen readers, um, listing um, is helpful if it's done in the correct way. Um, so using those format features, um, the, the bullets and um, numer numerical sequencing um, are, are really important instead of, um, and this is, these features have been around for quite some time in Word, um, so much so that they will automatically apply them to your content when you think that you are generating one. Um, but they will, um, <clears throat> they'll, they'll prompt a screen reader with the information that's about to follow. So you'll see that like um, on this slide, um, we have bulleted lists and then we'll be prompted that like we have a list here with three items in it um, and then it will go through the items. Um, for creating sequential lists, um, 
here I've used um, numbers to help with the sequencing. We just want to make sure that when you are um, doing sequential lists that you actually have an order that you need to be following. That's that's really the difference between bullets and, and numbered lists. Um, and again, um, I know that people will either want a different kind of bullet or maybe they want to use a star instead of the bullet or sometimes we just get frustrated with auto formatting um, and we try to just break that away and create our own formatting. Um, I hear you, um, but the again, the, the more that we use this, the more Microsoft's been updated. Um, these are becoming friendlier and they're also going to be helping um, more people understand your, your content um, by using it um, the way that it's, um, it's supposed to be used. Okay, um, we're going to talk about images very quickly. I think when um, we talk about um, digital accessibility, this is probably one of the most common um, areas that people um, people find issues, um, and it's also one of the the most readily fixable, um, which is which is nice. Um, so on this slide, we have that lovely access is love um, photo again. Um, and then I've also taken a screenshot of what that alt text would look like um, from our from our own um, PowerPoint panel. Um, this um, has changed. Uh, I'm using Word or I'm using Office 2019 right now. Um, in the 2016 and potentially the edition before as well, there were. Um, two areas under alt text um, that could be filled out. There was a title and there was a description. Um, I'm very glad that they've gotten rid of that. I think it confused a lot of people. Um, if you still have that 2016 version, um, you do not have to fill out the title. Um, what is in the description is what is going to be read. Um, yeah. So are you going to the decorative? I one? am. <laughs> so um, our next, um, the next item that I wanted to discuss on the alt text is the um, push button that says mark as decorative. Um, this is um, uh, part of part of having visual um, pieces to our documents um, sometimes is, is really just for style um, and it doesn't actually enhance the comprehension of of what it is. Um, that you're you're trying to say with the words on of your content, um, and in these instances, you don't really need to have um, an an alternative text available, but you do have to make sure that a screen reader knows to not look for it. Um, the issue if you just have something that's decorative um, and you um, just leave it without an alt text is that it's going to then just read the file name of whatever that image is. And as we know, sometimes file names are very weird <laughs> um, and long and you don't want you don't want that to be automatically read. So by marking something as decorative, it's basically hiding it um, from a, a screen reader. So it's just saying you don't have to worry about this. Um, it doesn't need anybody's attention. Um, there is. Um, it's, I guess you could say it's a matter of opinion to some people about what should and should not be considered decorative um, versus informative. Um, the, on, on one end of the spectrum is that um, we have a lot of, um, it, unless the, unless the, the text is specifically um, speaking to something that is stated in the image, um, you, you don't really need um, to have, to have an um, alternative tag for it. So um, if- Can I share one quick example? And a green border, um, I clicked on that in the master of this. So for every single slide that is marked as decorative. Mm -hmm. because it doesn't matter. Yeah, so we don't we don't really need to see that. And this um, also goes back to, um, I forget who had the question about the, the color of the, the tables. Um, it's a, in a similar vein um, where it's not, it's not important, it's not imperative information. Um, that's not gonna change 
uh, anybody's understanding of the content by like what color it is. So like that's why that's why a screen reader isn't um, isn't bringing it in. Um, on this slide, I think that's that's a perfect example, Jesse. The background we don't need to worry about. Access is love because I mentioned it in my presentation. Should be um, tagged. Um, the getting meta here. The alt text panel uh, because I mentioned it should be tagged. Mm -hmm. um, if we were to go back to um, our know your audience side where I have a photo of a large audience. Um, that doesn't necessarily um, enhance anybody's understanding beyond just having a having a visual that's paired with it. So that doesn't really need to have a description. Val, do you have a question? I just had a quick question. So if you had say a cartoon or a graphic organizer as a photo that's in there, you would not want to click that then, correct? You would want it read? If you can, can you like if it was say one of Michael's cartoons was a photo, a picture that was an, an image embedded, so then you wouldn't want to click that little button then, correct? It says Yeah, so um we had a question in the room. Oh, I'm way ahead, sorry. Um we had a question in the room about um if you have if you have an image um or like a cartoon that's um that's been added with with like actual like with actual word words and stuff, yeah, or text. Um, if we would want that to be um, that to be tagged as um, with alternative text, and the answer is usually yes, um, unless like unless it's um, a redundant picture. If it's already been in, um, if it's already been in a document, um, you don't need to have it tagged twice unless it's specifically being referred to again. Um, or um, yeah, you, yes. So then all the other times you do want that. Um, we get into trouble sometimes when we have words that are being displayed um, in images um, without having some way of then reading those images. So I would um font and color. Things font and color, we're gonna we're gonna get there. Um, so I'm very quickly going to share another example um, from the Mosaic Center. Um, we got um, we got a come ice skating with us um, a flyer, which um, I think is great. I think this is also a very good example of uh, plain language. Um, we have um, good word economy. We have pertinent information here, and not much else. Um, one of the um, issues as like as this document just stands here is that it's actually an image file. Um, so if we were to send this out um, as as an email by itself, um, we wouldn't have any way of reading. Our screen reader wouldn't have any way of reading um, any of the content on here. But if this was going to be um, an image that was going into a document, um, we could just put in the alternative text, and the alternative text would be um, all the content that's listed here. So um, come ice skating with us, no experience needed, rental escapes included November 17th, 2019. Um, I would recommend that this, um, because there is also like sign up information, that this not just be an alt text, um, uh, in, or not just an image file, that this would be, um, would probably be better as a PDF, um, but I don't wanna get too far off um, Pace, we have another question in the room. So if your image is a table or a graph, you have to alt text explain exactly every bar where it's at. So, so yeah, so um, the question in the room was what about um, tables or charts that are actually images that are inserted into another document? Um, those do need to have alternative text. Um, those I would classify um, as figures versus just images. Um, and you do have to, um, to, to be accessible, you really do need to make sure that all of that information is outlined um, in a way that someone can access. Um, and that could be, um, that could mean just like giving the title of the, the graph in as the alt text, but then within the, the actual content of your document, saying that um, a plain text version of this chart or like an explanation of the data in this chart is available and then linking to where that could be available. So it doesn't all have to be within just the, 
um, just that image. Okay, um, we are against the clock right now. Um, so I'm going to move forward um, and talk about our, our hyperlinks. Um, these again are not exclusive to just documents. Uh, we see these on websites, we use them in our emails. Um, we wanna make sure that we're using descriptive language. Um, we're not just simply putting click here in, in the hyperlink um, because you don't really know where that is. Uh, um, you need to have more context, context um, for where you are sending a person. Um, if you're linking to another document, making sure that you have in parentheses what kind of file that is, um, is also really important so that um, you know again where you're going to be navigating to. Um, and not just copy and pasting the, um, the URL. Again, um, URLs are lengthy, they're messy. Um, you don't want that to be, to be read out loud. Um, and visually, that also takes up a lot of space. Having, having items um, hyperlinked as, um, as part of your sentence structure um, keeps, your, keeps your flow very nice um, within, within a document. Um, okay. Font, style, and size. I'm um, sorry that we're moving at a, a faster clip here. I will make more resources available if you have more questions about this. Um, for Word, we want to make sure that we're, um, for actually for both Word and PowerPoint, we want to make sure that we're avoiding um, really stylized fonts. Um, a lot of times, like the serif fonts um, that have a lot of curvature to them are, are harder to see. Um, we want to make sure that we're using um, a size that um, is um, is big enough to be read. So in Word, um, try to use at least a 12-point font. Um, technically, 10-point or higher is fine, but I would encourage to try to use 12-point. Um, Again, having some of that white space. Um, on this slide, you can see we, um, we have about um, eight actual lines of text here um, and there's still there's still a lot of space around it um, having things look very crowded also means that you can lose your space um, or lose your space in um, in what you're reading um, and um, less less can be more um, in this way the uh, minimum size for um, powerpoint is going to depend on um, how you're presenting it and where you're presenting it. The screen size um, is, going to, is going to make the biggest difference. Um, and also how far away your audience members are sitting. If they're really far away um, and you don't have that big of a screen, you're gonna really wanna think about how, how your material is being presented. Um, best rule um, is to try not to go below um, a 28 uh, point font. Um, again, keeping those, slides um, pretty spacious. You don't need to crowd with a lot of text. Um, and keeping font consistent is also is also important. Um, it's recommended that you don't really use more than like three styles within within a document. Um, you don't need to be creating extra um, extra processing uh, of information. Um, so um, I, we get this question Pretty, pretty regularly about what some of the best font choices are. Um, so Ariel, uh, Calibri, uh, Verdania, am I saying any of these correctly? I think, hopefully. <laughs> I've never <laughs> um, had to say them. I know, that. yeah, I just always read them to myself. Um, and Helvetica are uh, good choices. If you're, again, using UVM Style Guide, um, I prefer to use uh, Brown Pro. Um, it looks the most, um, like linear and does not have that much um, like ornate decoration around it. Um, yeah, the, so this is this is Jesse. Um, this is the number one question that we that I get a lot. Um, I, I spend a lot of time researching um, and, and there there is no agreement um, <laughs> except for a couple of basic fonts that that um, Jean already shared. Um, there's probably many, many fonts out there that visually um, are accessible um, and a screen reader can read um, and that that checks a lot of boxes um, af after that it really gets down to debate I think one important thing to know um, and maybe to check as you're creating documents in Microsoft Office 
is that if you have a font um, like brown, um, mm -hmm. which is uh, that's that's one of the official fonts mm -hmm. that UVM uses, is not free. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have brown um, on my computer. Um, if somebody else opens it on their computer and they don't have that font, um, it won't change. Um, so you might want to use more common fonts um, when you're going to be sharing digital documents because they might just change anyway. Uh, um, and there's general agreement. Well, at least uh -huh. two people have voted that they do not like Comic Sans. <laughs> so if you're sharing them with people on this webinar, <laughs> at least a couple would prefer you not using Comic Sans. Well said, well said. Um, so last and certainly not least um, is color contrast. Um, I've put on this slide some of the uh, most basic regulations um, that um, talk about contrast ratio and I'm sure to most people this all just looks like gibberish. Um, we have there are two two standard levels that we're we're interested in um, and that's double uh, A AA and triple A. Triple A um, is a higher standard that means that it is um, it, like ac accessible uh, for more people um, and um, I put the the ratios that are needed here, um, uh, which again probably don't mean anything unless you unless you work with color and graphic design. Um, I do want to differentiate um, between normal text and large text. Um, usually, large text is defined as um, a 14 point bolded or larger, or 18 point in a regular font size, um, and I'm. Um, yeah, always going to say when possible, try to go for the higher, higher standard. Um, and I, but I also understand that it's very difficult, especially when you're working within a specific color palette, um, and, um, wanting, want, and you want to make sure that like your, your design has some sort of vibrancy to it. Um, we have resources that we will share with you about how to check your color contrast, um, as well as a PDF that looks at UVM's color com like color combinations within our within our color palette. Um, I am going to skip the example for this one because we're we're short on time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that makes a sense. Um, and 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 again. You know, it's hard. It's hard to eyeball color. So Jane's mm -hmm. got a specific resource that you can use if you're not sure if the contrast um, is high is enough. Is high enough? Yes. Um, so we're going to talk uh, very quickly about the the saving and the sharing of documents. Um, what I am going to recommend. I know that this is this is not about saving nor sharing. This is about checking. Um, but I still think that it belongs in this step is making sure that you're always doing an accessibility check um, before you share a document. Um, getting into that practice the same way that you would reread an email before you send it um, is really just going to build a better habit and it's not going to take that much time. Um, as you get better at accessibility, um, like just putting these things, embedding them into your work, um, it will take even less time. Um, and it's it's just it's a good practice to have. Um, there is a way in your email even to to prompt people to send you accessible content. Um, so and then um, our our um, Outlook emails also have accessibility checkers in there. Um, so just making this as much as uh, as much of a habit as you can is um, going to be really helpful. Um, so we have access to accessibility checkers within. Um, PowerPoint and within Word document uh, and within Word, um, and they are very helpful, but they don't guarantee um, they don't guarantee accessibility, even if they say that they can't find any errors. Um, you want to make sure that some of them. Um, you always want to make sure that you're checking some things manually. Color contrast being one of them. Reading order also um, being one of them. Outlook or Microsoft says that it can check for reading order, um, but it's it's still definitely being developed. Um, what, oh, so yeah, we we have specific resources that we want to share about um, the um, accessibility um, checks, include for um, Word, for PowerPoint, and also um, for PDFs. Um, 
We also have a link to a free PDF checker. This is all on our resources page um, that we're going to share with you at the end of this uh, presentation. Um, and that, I'm just okay. responding to another question. Okay. Can you ask a good one? But okay. Is it worth running it through a screen reader? You, so uh, we had a question in the room about whether or not it's worth um, running a document through a screen reader, and um, that is, um, it's a great practice, um, but it takes a lot of time to get used to um, navigating a screen reader if it's something that you you're not used to using um, and um, yeah that, that can that can pose some some hiccups as well if you if you do get comfortable with it or if you want to if you want to learn how to use a screen reader or if you already do know how um, I would absolutely recommend doing that that will that will alert you very quickly where there are problems um, but there are some things that maybe your own user error and not necessarily errors within um, within the document itself um, so the, um, I know we had a lot of questions and some of the, the documents that were sent were also sent to us as PDFs. Um, when we are putting information online, um, a good practice is to make it as a, like to share it as a PDF instead of as a Word document or as, um, as a PowerPoint presentation. Um, but we wanna make sure that we're saving it in a, a manner that will then carry over all of the accessibility work that we've done in those master files. Um, the reason that this training was a training on two office applications and not on PDF accessibility is because it is much, much, much easier to do this work in the source document. Um, so once you've done as much as you can in that, then you can save um, as a PDF and you want to make sure that you are saving it in a way that will carry that stuff over. So um, for Mac users, um, when you save as, you now have the option to create it, uh, to save it in a different file format as a PDF. Um, you'll also see on the screenshot that there are two um, radio buttons. One says best for printing, the one that is selecting says best for electronic distribution and accessibility, um, uses Microsoft online services. So that's going to take a lot of that stuff that you may not be able to see visually, but has been kind of like coded within your work through using that formatting. Um, and that will carry it over into the PDF and will really help you um, at that stage. Okay. Like too too far over? Are we good? Oh no, we're good. Okay, you want to switch again? <laughs> All right. So everyone's exhausted, <laughs> overwhelmed. You're you're really wondering about that contrast ratio for smaller fonts and larger fonts, uh, uh, and uh, wondering how you're going to do that. So uh, we'll we'll take a breath. Um, and this is really an introduction. Uh, to a lot of these concepts. I know for me, I'm, I'm definitely on my own learning curve, and this is using Microsoft Word and PowerPoint in ways that I've never used them before. Um, they go against the ways I've taught myself how to use them, which is usually to gear up for battle uh, with Microsoft every time I create a new document. Um, and a, a big take home message, I think from this is uh, to go with the flow more. Uh, using more of Microsoft's built-in layout and styles um, will actually um, improve the accessibility. Um, and if you're like me and you really care exactly what font it is and what it looks like, you can still edit that, but start simple. Start with an existing template. Um, so this was really a slide that I created for myself, um, thinking that, you know, what are just a, a few simple ways to get started um, with this? So. The first way you can do is you probably have a Word or a PowerPoint file open on your computer right now. Run the check accessibility feature on it. What do you find? Uh, what errors or warnings do you receive that you might immediately know how to fix because of today's webinar? Or you might remember we mentioned, but we didn't talk about in depth, or you might need to research it more. Try it out. Try it out today. Um, that's one of my main recommendations for getting started. Um, even better uh, would be to think about a document you're about to create 
as Jean shared several times, it's harder to go back and fix documents. But if you've got a blank screen in front of you and you're creating that new PowerPoint or Word file, um, start with start with some of the recommendations that we've made today to, to build it from the ground up. Um, there'll be a learning curve. It'll take you a little bit longer to create it um, and it will be more accessible um, and will become part of your routine. Even better, and Jean mentioned this a couple of times, think about what documents that you create frequently. So maybe agendas, maybe memos, maybe meeting minutes, uh, maybe uh, a course presentation. Create some templates or find some templates that work for you and check the accessibility of the template. Um, and then once you've got it the way you want it, don't create it anymore. Stick to your template, trust it. Um, if you want to change it, know that it's going to uh, take a little bit of time um, to update. The other thing, and this is this was Jean's idea, and I think it's a great one, um, is that increasingly we should be using each other um, at the University of, uh, of Vermont. Um, so if you've got a team of folks, and I'm looking around a room right now at people at CDCI um, that have taken this together, that are thinking about trying it out together, um, share those templates with each other, share questions uh, that you have with each other. Uh, a lot of that's been happening on chat already. Um, also, I want to return to the point that uh, disability is diversity. So when we're thinking about inclusive excellence, it's written into our framework at this university. So when you're talking about your inclusive excellence plan, uh, maybe at a unit level or a college level, or maybe just at your own desk level, um, make accessible documents part of that work. Um, and then please, 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 please um, share your successes um, and your questions uh, with us uh, afterwards. We're particularly excited to shine a light on what's working well um, and what people are trying out uh, at the university. We'd love to brag about it. Um, can I, this is Jean again, um, just from our, from our chat box real quick. Um, we also have uh, Hope who is offering um, mm -hmm. us some information that uh, they are planning a December or January workshop on how to remediate Word, PowerPoint, and especially PDF documents that have already been created and are not accessible. So mm -hmm. um, I'll see all of you there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then as a, as a third broad area that you can do as a next step um, is, is you need to learn more. Um, and, and there are some great resources out there. This webinar really is more of an introduction um, than a skills development. Um, so as Jean mentioned before, uh, we are um, updating um, and trying to uh, keep current um, our own accessibility uh, page. And it's going to have a lot of the things that we talked about today. Um, and then also want to give, do you want to say something about that? I don't know if we want to show them. Um, to. Let's keep going. <laughs> it looks great. <laughs> you'll, you'll love it. Um, and, and, and again, we'll, we'll make sure you've got all of these links. Um, uh, but I also want to give a shout out to Student Accessibility Services and the resources they have. Uh, the reason that we have live captioning for this webinar today uh, is because of them um, and their partnership with uh, White Coat Captioning. So thank you both. Um, specifically for people teaching courses or using Blackboard. Uh, Blackboard Ally is uh, a new feature this year, um, and it does an accessibility check of documents that you upload to Blackboard. Um, so a lot of things that we've talked about today are relevant for that, and the Center for Teaching and Learning uh, is, is supporting that as well. Um, and then the fourth uh, area for learning more really sort of um, uh, one of the best places to go for information and a lot of the resources we'll share with you um, it come from web aim um, and this is at the university of utah it's actually our sister uh, center there has this as a project um, they're really providing national level um, resources um, and how-to guides and they also have an online training uh, that i'm i'm participating in right now that uh, goes in in more depth and is, is in uh, more hands-on than we can do in two hours So the last thing, last question uh, for our participants is how helpful uh, was this webinar? And um, what we have is a training survey uh, for you to complete. And we're going to use the rest of our five minutes uh, to ask you to complete it right now. Um, our, uh, it's always hard when you move on to the next thing. Um, if you can't complete it right now because you're not at a computer um, or you've already left, 
and you're listening to this much later, uh, the link is still live, uh, so you can still give us feedback. Um, we're going to um, provide um, the when people have the PowerPoint, this is something you could click on. Um, I believe Gene is putting it into chat uh, right now, but this will pull up a, a training survey uh, for you to complete. Um, it is uh, anonymous, uh, so it's not linked to your registration um, and it's not linked to your email address. Um, did that link go out in the chat? OK, so that's in chat right now for folks that are going to do it right now. Um, and so the second to last thing I'll say is we also want to try out a follow up survey. Um, so what you're going to complete right now is a satisfaction survey, kind of how helpful you think it is at the moment. Uh, but we really don't know if this webinar was helpful to you or not unless we follow up and ask if you're using this information. So after you complete the survey today, after you hit the submit button, it's going to send you to another survey. Aren't you lucky? Mm -hmm. And all it asks is, are you willing to give us your email address so we can follow up with you later? Giving us your email address doesn't link it to the survey you just completed. That's still anonymous. Um, but of course, if you do give us your email address and we follow up um, to ask you um, a, just how you're using this information, then we would know, uh, would then your, your data would be linked. Uh, we wouldn't share it, uh, but it would be confidential at that point. Um, so with that request, um, I will simply say thank you uh, for joining us today. I'm very honored um, and was excited to see how many people uh, registered for this. I'm so thankful uh, for Jean um, Nauheimer uh, having this as expertise and, and allowing me to uh, not just recommend we do it as a professional development for our center, but to open the doors and to have uh, approximately 60 more people join us at the university. And we will follow up with all of you uh, with the resources that we shared today. And once uh, it's it's ready, uh, we'll make the recorded webinar available. Can we go back to the page and address? Oh, yeah. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> um, and we're going to leave this open for the uh, remainder of the webinar. <clears throat>